Hi, my name is Amanda Chupan and I am a writer. Um, and I just want to thank all of the other um, participants and just extend my congratulations to them because writing isn't easy and I am just um, excited and proud that um, we all made it this far. So uh, the essay that I submitted for the award is called uh, It Starts With a Shatter and it really is just an exploration of the um, differences in writing um, between myself and my colleagues that I experienced when I lived and I wrote and I worked in the US. Um, I went to US, went to the US to pursue an MFA in a writing program and I just found that um, that I was writing from this space, from this modality of like a moral, like a moral compass. Um, a lot of Caribbean literature and writing that we read, um, at least traditionally, has been um, kind of focused on satire, um, on a morality tale. Um, the sense that, you know, um, we read so that we can bring order to a disorderly world and to, you know, somehow entertain this fantasy of people getting what they deserve. Um, that feels to me like a very Caribbean space. Um, but when I went to the US, I found that so many of my friends were not informed by this and were writing these sort of like quirky, um, experimental, loose stories that felt as though there were very few things at stake or nothing at stake politically. And then this was in the context of the last US presidential election when so many things were at stake politically. That's really the context for this particular essay that's part of this collection that I hope to, to write. It starts with a shatter. Blood comes in different forms. One color for blood which has been satisfied, oxygen filled, the other type still gasping for breath. They both run through us, one red hot, one purple cooled. We record some moments as exemplary a spike in the EKG of time, a smashed heart, a broken world, but the reality is that we are always gasping for breath. In Los Angeles, there is a pitch lake too. In the middle of the city, near to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, it's a tourist attraction just like ours, albeit with some California shine. There's a sculpture of a family of woolly mammoths rearing their legs in shock as one of its own sinks deeper into the pit. A Trinidad pitch is alive, People who walk its lake, the largest in the world, our lake, say they can hear it hiss and spit. The primordial muck speaks, choked with either emotion or indigestion. It remembers the time it was forced to move its hand, or rather its clawing, roaring belly against a tribe of Chima Indians. The legend goes that they, victorious in battle, stopped at that very spot to celebrate, head sopping with triumph, they roasted calibri, hummingbirds, and ate them. One by one, the bones and the delicate bodies popped on the fire. The bright blue of their tiny throats charred. The light speed wings stilled forever. They crunched and swallowed, masters of man and diminishers of beautiful things. The muck, disturbed by this, pushed forth. It swallowed the tribe in a matter of seconds. For the spoils of the urgent, erotic present had erased the still living past. To the Chima Indians, hummingbirds were sacred as they contained the souls of their ancestors. They had literally been vanquishing themselves. Caribbean people do love their morality tales. Parables are beautifully symmetrical. There are few things more satisfying to us than irony. It's the felling of the too tall tree we like, the redistribution of power. In secondary school, I wrote like Naipaul, I tried to, for my English exams. I thought stories of checked hubris, of funny flamboyant usurpers destroyed by the same society who had made them, were perfect. In university, my American writer friends could not understand this. As she went to art school, um, same difference. They weren't writing from a Nancy. They're writing for the New Yorker in a strange, morally ambiguous groove that I began to learn characterize the new American short story. I wanted my protagonist punished. I wanted the kind of order I had learned needed to be imposed upon the world, the strike against colonialism, the exposure of the corrupt, to be required reading again. But my colleagues saw those stories with their predictable forthrightness boring. To survive in these writing circles, I would have to cultivate a looseness of limb to casually stroke meanings from life by writing artful flash fiction about a chair or a dinosaur, stories in which no one lost and no one won. 
The stakes were never political, as in the stories I had loved. A culture, a people, a person's soul were never at stake. At my lowest point, I began to wonder if the writing I had loved was a lesser form, since my white classmates were not interested. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Marina Solandi Brown and I'm the founder and festival director of the NGC Bogus at Fest Trinidad Tobago's Annual Literary Festival. I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to the announcement of the winner of the 2020 OCM Bogus Prize for Caribbean Literature. Under normal circumstances, the prize announcement is the centerpiece of the annual NGC Bogus at Fest and the winner is usually announced as a somewhat smart, glamorous ceremony with dozens of literary eminences in the audience. Quite early on this year, though, we decided that in the 10th year of the festival and the prize, we should do something different, though we didn't know it was going to be this different. And it's not exactly what we had in mind, but because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, our festival, like so many other events around the world, has had to be postponed. Although we can't gather together this evening, all of us here, you know, for this prize ceremony, we still have the opportunity to honour and celebrate our winning writers through the virtual event. The OCM Bogus Prize, as many of you know, is considered the most prestigious annual award for Caribbean writers and it's sponsored since 2011, the year we started, by One Caribbean Media. The prize recognises the best books published in each calendar year by writers of Caribbean birth or citizenship in three categories poetry, fiction, and non-fiction. Some weeks ago, our panel of nine judges, nine eminent judges from around the world, chaired by none other than Earl Loveless, himself a previous winner of the OCM Bocas Prize, announced a long list of nine books, which were, in the poetry category, Honeyfish by Lauren K. Alain, Skin Can Hold by Vanny Capodeo, and Epiphania by Richard Georges. In the fiction category, The Confessions of Franny Langton by Sarah Collins, Everything Inside by Edwidge Danticat, and A Tall History of Sugar by Cadella Forbes. In the non-fiction category, Moments of Corporation and Incorporation by Erna Broadbear, Beyond Coloniality by Erin Kamogisha, and Shame on Me by Tessa McWatt. Congratulations to all nine writers whose books demonstrate the range and vitality of contemporary Caribbean writing across the genres. I know the judges thought that there were some very, very fine entries, so congratulations to all the writers whose books were entered and made the long list as well. In the next stage of the prize, the judges selected a winner in each of the three genre categories, and they are Epiphania by Richard Georges, Everything Inside by Edwidge Danticat, and Shame On Me by Tessa McWatt. And these three books now form the shortlist of the overall prize, which we're announcing this evening, and which the winner will receive 10,000 US dollars as the award. Before we get to naming the winner, we will share with you some short readings from the shortlisted books by their authors, introduced by the respective chairs of the three judging panels. Richard Georges, introduced by Lawrence Reiner, Edwidge Danticat, introduced by Barbara Lalla, and Tessa McWatt, introduced by Bridget Brereton. After the reading, we will hear from our distinguished chief judge, Earl Lovelace, who will announce the overall winner. Let the festivities begin. My name is Larry Briner, and I'm the chair of the panel of judges for the 2020 OCM Focus Prize for Poetry. I'm grateful for the invitation to serve as a judge and grateful as well for the pleasure of working with Sandeep and Rajiv, fine poets who are also alert readers. I have to say my favorite thing about the task is that evaluating the entries for the Bocas Prize is absolutely the best way to take the pulse of Anglophone Caribbean poetry. This year, all the vital signs are strong. 
Altogether, we read 20 volumes of poetry that represented every level of experience, recognition, and accessibility. Roughly a quarter came from each of four categories, major international publishers, self-publishing, local publishing in the region, and small presses abroad. The wide geographical distribution of the writers across the region and the diaspora is also a strong indicator that poetry is alive and thriving in the Caribbean. As it turned out, some of our best and most prolific poets had published last year, but we also heard completely new voices. And remarkably, hardly any of these voices sounds like anyone else. Out of a short list of about five poets that all the judges agreed would certainly be worthy of the prize, the entry we selected as the winner was the latest book by Richard Georges. Here are some of the reasons for our choice. In our initial round of comments, one judge wrote, I couldn't put this collection down. I read it three times. We all agreed. These are poems you will read more than once and they will be richer each time. More challenging and in some cases more demanding. Richard George's remarkable technical skill is evident but unobtrusive and generally he does not draw attention to himself in his poems. His lyric eye is not confessional. It's an eye that sees on our behalf. These poems are written in the aftermath of Hurricanes Irma and Maria, but that occasion for writing is not the main reason this feels more urgent than his previous collections. There's also a newly uninhibited intellectual vigor and vision here. These are accessible poems lit with the elation of discovery that pack a complex emotional punch. The judges are really delighted to honor this accomplishment by one of the members of the region's phenomenal generation of younger poets. My name is Richard Georges and I'm the author of Epiphania. Epiphania is a meditation on the recovery of the communities in the British Virgin Islands following the devastation of Hurricane Oma. And now I'll read a couple poems. An inventory for survival. The next morning, the coral lay in piles, heaped into roadside mounds on the island's southern coast. It's a stretch the sea beguiles as it wears away the rock embankment, but the coral stones still remind the eye of funeral pyres, an enchantment perhaps, from when I skirted the coastal parts of the Essequibo, the Hindu cremation plots on the ridge, the coast walled from the highway, only the scant platforms of fire, the dense smoke rising like snakes in the air. On Tortola, the smoke forms sparsely on the banks of the ravines, aches across the burning hillsides before settling somewhere above it all. The thing that breaks us is all there is sometimes. The bettering of death teeters on obsession, but then we each come to our own private reckoning, our own single raptures the damn air screaming, and us making bathtub altars, speaking the names of our children like prayer. Dead Reckoning. They say birds always find their way back home, but home is a nowhere a memory, a never was. Do wings remember spaces in the air the way we might a place, a field of rice? How do you fly back to that? Away from a tomb of fears, this place yearning for you. Some years ago, I lay bright flowers on my grandmother's grave. Years before, I see my grandfather's ashes taken by the furrowing wind in the Bocas Islands. 
I am not myself, nor have I ever been something apprehending the sun and other bright celestial objects, thinking this is a tapestry in orbit around me. I am completely convinced that we are the last creatures to discover how to be in the world. My beard grows wild. My children brush past me in the darkness. Their chattering voices fill my ears and then my chest, and I cannot hold it in. I am always coming home. My name is Barbara Lala, and I've chaired the panel of judges for the fiction category of the 2020 OCM Bocas Prize, working with Sharon Leach and Candida Lacey. Out of a wealth of excellent submissions, we were blown away by Edwidge Danticat's Everything Inside, which comprises urgent, breathtaking, and profoundly resonant short stories. Danticat's light touch devastates in presenting characters caught between two worlds and always ultimately at odds with themselves. Her approach to the hyphenated existence, the Haitian American dilemma, is all the more haunting for being understated. As ever, she conveys and evokes searing emotion in an artfully combined and varied collection of stories that echo on in the head after the text is closed. Her words rain gently like the spatter of wine in one of the stories, as a toast to those who are not here. The horrific past of certain characters is the more moving for being subtly delivered, its full weight gathering in the reader's consciousness after the book is closed. So, a grandmother debilitated by dementia dangles a baby over a railing, yet finds herself in the loving and grateful hands of the mother, who is her daughter. Unifying the tales is this dialectic of holding and letting go. The judges found themselves in awe of Dante Katz's control over language and through language over audience perception and response. The fluidity and persuasiveness of her pellucid prose and her delicate blend of passion and compassion sweep the reader along. A woman is surprised and borne up by relief that a former friend who betrayed her is alive rather than yet another dead person she has known. We are lifted by the resilience and essential humanity of her central consciousnesses, even where these occupy the darker corners of the author's tragic vision. These are poignant tales that burn into your brain. Hello, congratulations to the Bocas Prize on your 10th anniversary, Felicitations. Congratulations too to my fellow winners. I'm extraordinarily honored to be in your company. My book is called Everything Inside. It's a collection of stories, eight stories set in different places from little Haiti, Miami, where I'm, I'm currently now, to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, to an unnamed Caribbean island. The stories are about love and migration and finding our places in the world. And um, I would like to share with you a short excerpt from the final story in the book called Without Inspection. Without Inspection is an immigration term in the United States, which means having entered the country without seeing an immigration official, which um, is, implies that technically we are not here, but we know that we are here. And, um, and this gentleman uh, whose story I will be reading from believes this. And that's a theme that goes throughout the rest of the stories as well. We are here and we love and we ache and we survive. Uh, so this is from Without Inspection. This gentleman is um, falling out of the sky literally and has just landed on the ground. This landing was even more abrupt than his last one. His free fall ended as his body slammed into the drum of the cement mixer. He was being tossed inside a dark blender full of grout. He pretended that he was swimming and tried to flutter kick, just as he had when the speedboat stopped in the middle of the ocean and he was told to swim ashore to Miami. 
He attempted arm strokes, but couldn't move either his arms or his legs. He reached for the shaft, what in a more stable place, in a house or a temple, or some other holy place you might call a potomita, a middle pillar. He felt lighter now, even lighter than when he was falling. His bones were melting, his blood evaporating, and he was now like parchment or something porous. He had not been paying attention to the alternating hum and jangle of the mixer. He hadn't noticed that there were streaks of blood polluting the cement or that he was feeling no pain. Then the mixer stopped spinning and he heard the stillness, which was soon replaced by screams and grunts and, oh my God. Then he heard the sirens, which took him back to the beach, to the gray sand and his loved one's sable face. From where he was lying inside the cement mixer, he saw an airplane cut across the clear blue sky. And that was when he realized he was dying and that his dying offered him a kind of freedom he had never had before. Whatever he thought he could see in front of him, whatever he wanted he could have, except what he wanted most of all, which was not to die. Thank you. Bridget Brereton, and I'm chair of the judges panel for the non-fiction prize for 2020. I'm speaking on behalf of my fellow panelists, Grace Aniza Ali and Ursula Owen. We considered 17 books. This was a diverse collection, which included biographies and autobiographies, memoirs, essays, historical works, books which were both academic and of more general scope. It was a strong field. And I'm delighted to say that our unanimous choice was Tessa McWatt's Shame on Me, An Anatomy of Race and Belonging. Tessa McWatt was born in Guyana. She emigrated with her family to Canada when she was a small child, and she grew up and was educated in Canada. She now lives in, in Britain. Her ancestry is quintessentially Caribbean, Arawakan, Chinese, East Indian, African, Portuguese, Scottish, English. She has ancestors from four continents. Her book is a meditation, a meditation on race, belonging, identity, family, and migration. It's structured as an anatomy of race and belonging, with chapters on nose, lips, eyes, hair, ass, bones, skin, and blood, the physical attributes by which we read race. Mark Watt reflects on what it means to be mixed, to have many ethnic identities, to have no clearly marked place that you come from or that you belong to. Her book is based on wide reading and erudition lightly born. It combines the erudition with deeply personal recollections of her family and her own history. This is a beautifully written, profoundly moving, and deeply reflective book. Tessa, we don't know each other, but I want to say how pleased my panel was to choose Shame on Me as a non-fiction winner, Bocus 2020 and how much we admire your important and brilliant book. Hello, I'm honored to be on the shortlist for the Bocas Prize for 2020. And I'd like to read from my book, um, but I'd also like to say that Shame on Me is about race and belonging and about finding new ways of looking at these issues. Um, but it's also about language and the poetry that exists between people. 
It's about how important language is in remaking our possible future or possible futures in a world that's so divided and formed by structural inequality. Uh, the book is organized as a science experiment on the body, on my body, and it has four sections. I'd like to read from the first section, which is called, um, entitled Hypothesis. A young Chinese woman, so young, nearly still a girl, runs through a field of sugar cane. Her cotton shift is torn, her hair wild. There is fear on her face. My grandmother. She is escaping something terrible. Her legs are scraped by sharp stalks. Blood is dripping from her knee. I imagine her eyes are streaming with tears. She is running because in her countryside village in Demerara, British Guyana, she has just been raped by her uncle. I imagine my Indian ancestor as a strong woman, perhaps originally from Oud, modern Uttar Pradesh, who could squat easily, hunched over green, sword-like leaves sprouting from emerging stalks. She is exhausted, pulling weeds out of unfamiliar soil in British Guiana, thin, Fragile from the 112 day journey by ship, she is lucky to have survived on a daily ration of beef or pork, suet, a biscuit, a few raisins. My Arawak ancestor is in a dugout corial on the Bora Bora River that runs through the Iwakrama forest. She paddles past a giant otter, sunning itself on a tree stump. My Portuguese ancestor, perhaps from Madeira, arrives among the first free immigrants to the colony in 1835. In her small Hessian sack, she has hidden 20 delicate squares of lace that she stitched while watching her father haul his fishing nets from the sea. There is a rumor about my French ancestor, but she will never confirm for anyone in the colony that her father had a chalice and a silver ring with a hexagon pattern, the Star of David, hidden in his suitcase when he arrived from France. My African great-great-grandmother is lost amongst trees that don't know her name, don't speak her language. Trees that have erased her. She can't find the path that will take her to the clearing. She is getting weak. I reach out to take her by the hand. My Scottish great-great-great-grandmother takes her last breath in East Lothian, and the book she has been reading falls across her chest. She never knows about the brown women with their hands in the soil. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am the chief judge of the OCM Bookers for this year, 2020. Um, in the year of the coronavirus, it seems uncanny that the winning book in each category should be dealing with challenges of catastrophe. In the case of um, Edwidge Danticat, the challenge of living and loving. In terms of um, Tessa McWatt, shame on me, and anatomy of race and belonging. Richard George's Epiphania was the winner. And this is the citation in regard to his winning presentation. In the aftermath of Hurricane Irma, Richard Georges presents us with Epiphania, poems that take us way beyond the ruins left by the storm. Responses to catastrophe frequently take refuge in evasion or cynicism, despair or glib resolution. 
Often they confine themselves in the familiar shapes of narrative, lamentation, or outrage. These poems take no such predictable shapes. It is as if each verse form were a different lens for viewing the storm and the life in its aftermath. What makes these offerings so poignant is that many of them are lit with the brilliant light of the day after. That epiphanic light of discovery is Richard George's gift to us. His poems become the prayers he wants poems to be, the unfurling of hope, of wonder, embracing lessons learned from ancestors, that devastated does not mean dead, that what has been emptied can be filled, that this road we travel can be washed away, erased, but we are here now. We are delighted to acknowledge this accomplishment by one of the region's phenomenal generation of younger poets. Friends and book lovers, I hope you will join me wherever you are to congratulate all three of our prize winners, most deserving prize winners, whose extraordinary books enrich our lives now more than ever as we turn to literature to encourage and inspire us in these most uncertain times. On behalf of the NGC Books at First team, I'd like to thank all ten judges for their devoted work, Earl Lovelace, Lawrence Briner, Rajiv Mohabir, Sandy Palmer, Barbara Lala, Candida Lacey, Sharon Leach, Bridget Burton, um, Grace Anicia Ali, and Ursula Owen. Of course, I must thank our very generous sponsor, One Caribbean Media, who sponsor this, this prize and have done so since 2011, the year that we started, and has made an enormous difference to Caribbean readers and writers over that period. Finally, sincere thanks to the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, title sponsor of the NGC Books at Fest. Fueled by their support, we are unrolling a rich program of online events and activities over the coming months, which can be enjoyed by our audience wherever you are, wherever you find yourself during this long COVID-19 shutdown. And come the weekend of the 18th to the 20th of September, we'll have the opportunity to celebrate our prize winners again at the rescheduled 2020 NGC Locusted Fest. Until then, happy reading. And don't forget, check our website consistently because we're going to be having a lot of stuff for you to see, hear and enjoy.